are the days. These are the days of Elijah. Declaring the word, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days. the days of great trials. harbor and we take it on for us give it to him because he will never fail you All of your trouble, 
You can give it to Jesus All of your burdens All of your cares Even your struggles You can give it to Jesus Cause he won't fail He won't fail No, he won't leave you No, no, he won't fail No, he won't fail your problems, all of your pain, all of your troubles, you can give it to Jesus, all of your burdens, all of your cares, even your struggles, you can give it to Jesus, he won't fail, he won't fail. say he won't fail he won't fail when you don't have a job he won't fail and the bills are due he won't leave you no he won't fail so he won't fail he won't fail so he won't fail he won't fail cuz he won't leave you he won't fail cuz we see it with our own eyes seen it in our own life. Hallelujah. Amen. The song says, you are our heart's one desire. We thirst for you. 
Is that your desire to just make God your priority? And I think sometimes, sometimes we jump off the bed trying to run to the bathroom and we fit to forget to say, Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity to do it again, to be in your will. Lord, we thank you. for you thirsty for you and you are hearts one desire only you can satisfy only you can satisfy you are our hearts you are Thirst for you, Lord. Thirsty for you. We're thirsty for you. Thirsty for you. You are our hearts. You are our hearts. One deep. Only you can satisfy. Only you can satisfy. Only you can satisfy. Say you are. You come. 
Enjoy that session of praise with our praise team this morning. Uh, these are the days of Elijah, and this morning we have with us uh, Chaplain Aaron uh, Newton, who will be delivering the Word of God. He's God's man that He's chosen for this day. He uh, has a, 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 a strong ped pedigree of preaching in his uh, family lineage. His dad was president of Northeastern Conference, his grandfather was president of Northeastern Conference, who was the one who had me ordained as an elder when I was back in New York. So I, I, I know the family from a, a long time. His dad was my sweet mate at Oakland College. He has a brother who preaches here in, um, in uh, the Southeastern Conference here in, in Florida. And he's a graduate of Miami Union Academy, Roxette. <laughs> so we have a homegrown preacher this morning, and we're indeed happy that he is with us. He, he just is uh, off of a, a recent crusade in Gainesville, Florida with Ron Smith, where they baptized 142 people, Sister Simmons. So uh, the Lord is using him mightily in his service. Uh, we also have with us this morning his lovely wife, Karina. Uh, you can stand against our focus here. <laughs> We're indeed happy that, that she is, she's um, here with the support him this morning. As I said, his name is Aaron. He is uh, Moses' brother. He supports. <laughs> and he has been a chaplain for the past 10 years, having completed his chaplaincy at Transitional Pathway. And we ask you to pray for him this morning that God will use him to bless us. Aaron, chaplain, Mo, uh, Newton, Moses' brother, come on up. <laughs> bless, bless the saints of the Lord. Check, check, open. Okay. Amen. Oh, it fell out. Happy Sabbath, church. God is good. God is good. And all the time. You know, I think when we say God is good, I think that is too small of a word to say. God is great. God is awesome. I know everyone in here has gone through something, and God has brought us far. I was speaking to my fiance, soon to be married. And we were talking this morning. I said I was going to mention this because, you know, the, the song that's been playing with us every day is We're Blessed by Fred Hammond. I think that we should change the national anthem to the national Christian anthem to be that we are blessed. We should not be here today, but Jesus came and died for us. I just came back from Gainesville, Florida at Pastor uh, Guerrero's church. And we baptized 143 people. 143 people gave their hearts to Christ. And it was just such a miraculous thing that I saw in that area because I seen so much working with the great Ron C. Smith. And something I could tell you about my ministry, the ministry that God has given me. Uh, Ron taught me this one thing. There are four ways to get in the home. And I wouldn't just say the home, but to get in the heart. There are four ways. It's called the Ford Method. Now, everyone in here can relate to the Ford Method. Everyone in here. There's no way possible that you can. The F stands for your family. We all have a family that's near and dear to our hearts. The O stands for occupation. Everyone in here loves to make money. We got to pay our bills. Uncle Sam got to get his taxes. So, of course, we have to work. The R stands for religion. 
We all in here are religious. We have a faith. We believe in Jesus Christ. We've given our hearts to Christ. So we're religious. Now, finally, that T is what's most important. Everyone in here has a testimony. Everybody's been through something. God has done something in your life. And if you don't speak on it, then you're doing an injustice to God. So me as a speaker, I speak from the word, but you will hear a lot of stories and testimonies of what I've been through because I am a testimonial speaker. I have to speak from the heart. If I don't speak from the heart, then I'm doing God and an injustice. I remember it like it was yesterday, even though it was a long, long time ago. I was speaking to my mom about the story this week because I knew I was going to mention it in my message. And me and my brother, the pastor of Daughter Zion Church, we grew up in New York, but we both were born in Boston, Massachusetts. And when, we, when I was in Boston, there was a school I used to go to when I was in pre-K kindergarten. And, you know, I remember the day, this is the only memory that I have of Boston. But it's funny that this week the memory came back to me. So it was one day... My mom said she was coming to pick me up for, for school. But me, as a little boy, being anxious and being who I am, I didn't listen to her. And instead of staying with the kids from school, I decided to wander off. I decided to walk off and say, you know what? I'm going to find my mom maybe at the street light down the road. So I took off and went on my little journey like I was Dora the Explorer. I kept walking and I kept moving and I just kept going. And before I knew it, I was lost. Before I knew it, there were tears flowing down my face because I didn't know where my mom was. I didn't know where the school was. And I did not know my way back. All I can tell you is that some strange man came up to me, took my hand, and walked me back to the school. Now, mind you, my mother never knew who that man was. The school never knew who that man was. And to this day, I don't remember the face of the man that took me back to school. The only thing I remembered, that I was emotional. The title of today's message is, don't get too emotional. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this time. This is your time, Lord. And so, Father, we're just asking in a special way that you speak to me. You speak through me and you use me. Lord, this word is for us today and we just thank you for being there for us. Now, Lord, as we just dive into your word and into the blessings that you have for us today, continue to be here we pray now take these loaves and these fish and multiply them we pray in Jesus name amen turn with me if you will our scripture today is found in John we're, we're going to a, a, a beautiful story which is found in the word of God we're going to John John chapter 11 John chapter 11 verses 17 through 26 John chapter 11 verses 17 through 26. Now I'm reading from the Christian Standard uh, Version, so um, bear with me if you can. It's the Christian Standard Version. You can follow in your King James Version. It says here, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha said, 
I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? Question I pose today to you is do you believe this? We live in a world now that we constantly see people are dying to the left of us. People are dying to the right of us. We see things on the news, the, the tragedy that happened in Baltimore. We see what's going on overseas. We see all these different things that are happening, and we constantly get emotional. Now, why is it that we get emotional? Webster says, emotion, wait a second here. Emotion is a natural instinct state of mind deriving from one circumstance, mood, or relation with one another. We all are emotional, but emotion just doesn't start with us. We have a God who has emotion. God has feelings. God can feel and he has emotion. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to one of the first texts where we saw God's emotion. Turn to me to Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5 and 6. Genesis 6 and verses 5 and 6. Word of God says, And when the Lord saw man's wickedness was spread on the earth, and that every scheme of his mind thought was nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he made man on earth, and he was grieved to his heart. We see here that man grieved the heart of God, that God has emotions just as much as we have emotions. Turn with me, if you will, to Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. We're talking about God and his emotion. Exodus chapter 20, verses 5. And six. It says here, you must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the father's sins of the third and fourth generation. We understand that God has emotion. And there's nothing wrong with emotion. But when you get over-emotional, Sometimes you can block out the reasoning of what God is trying to do in your life. Now, let's think of Jesus and Jesus' emotion. It says here, emotion. A, 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 I am spellbound by the intensity of Jesus' emotion. Not a twing of pity, but heartbroken compassion. Not a passing irritation, but terrifying anger. Not a silent tear, but a groan of anguish. Not a weak smile, but a great celebration. Jesus' emotion was like a mountain river cascading with a clear water. My emotions are more like a muddy foam or a feeble trickle. When we think of Jesus and his emotions, he was different in his emotion and different in his situation. Let's take me, for instance, in my emotion. There was a moment in my life where I received a phone call because I've worked several different meetings with Ron Smith. And Ron called me and he said, listen, uh, Dr. Newton, we have a meeting that's going on in Buffalo, New York, and we would like for you to take part in this meeting. So he told me, he said, listen, would you be interested in coming? If you could you come, could you drive? Now, mind you, where do we stay? We stay in South Florida. So now I have to drive all the way from the bottom of the United States to the top of the United States. Now, mind you, ladies and gentlemen, I have a fear of heights. I have a fear of heights. Now, if you've ever taken this journey, there is a certain point in this journey where you're driving 
and you got to go through the mountains. So if you've never driven through the mountains, imagine having to drive through the mountains. So I'm going on this journey, and I stop off in Virginia because I know once I get to the Virginia area, that's where we're going to get to the mountains. So I say, Lord, I don't want to do this at night. I need to be able to see. If I can't see, then it's going to be a problem. So I go to sleep that night, and I say, I'm going to get up early. I know all my pastoral friends get up, and they're having worship with God, so maybe I could call a few of these guys, and they could pray with me while I'm taking this journey. I get up. It's 5 in the morning. I have my worship. I get on the road at 6. I dial one number. No answer. I dial another number. There is no answer. Then I begin to say, Lord, you got me going through this thing by myself. There's no one at all for me to have on the phone. And as I'm driving, I begin to see the mist and the fog go up into the sky. I get to see the beauty of the clouds. I begin to see the sun rays shining on these mountains. And then God reminded me of the text that the faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain. He said, my son, if if you want, your faith can move these mountains out of the way. So why are you so fearful? For I am with you. A lot of times when we get in certain situations, we focus so much on self and allow self and the emotions of self to make us forget where God has brought us in the past. God has brought us out of so much. We're all here. We're a melting pot. Some of us are Americans. Some of us are from other islands. And God brought us here safely. He has brought our families out of traumatic situations, whether it be sickness, whether it be finances. If God is for us, then who can be against us? We need to realize that our emotions are just a barrier. That's going to separate us from Christ. Keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Persons who have uneven temperance appear to have much greater chance of developing serious illness and of dying of a younger than others who have a better temperance. We have to keep our minds centered and focused on what God can do for us. I remember it like it was yesterday. Actually happened about two years ago. I just finished preaching a word at the Daughter of Zion Church. And I received a phone call from one of my good friends. And she said to me, she said, listen, you know, chaplain, um, I'm cooking a great lunch. You should come by and have lunch. You uh, tell your brother and the family to come by. My brother, of course, couldn't make it, but I said, I'm going to come down. So I drive down to Miami, and I get down not too far from this area here, and I park my car right across the street. And as I'm parking my car right across the street, I just hear some noises behind my car. And I look, and who is it? It's the It's the police. Police jumps behind me and they say, the pastor of this church, because it was crossed from an old person's home, because that's where the lady stayed in an old person's home. He he says that the pastor has been complaining about people parking here. So the young lady police officer goes to review my information. And as she reviews my information, we go to find out that Chaplain Newton has a warrant. Yes. Yes. A warrant in North Carolina. I says, how do I, a minister, have a warrant in North Carolina? So I I was perplexed. I couldn't understand the situation. I says, you must be mistaken, officer. Are you sure this is not another chaplain, Newton? Is this another person? She says, no, uh, it's you, sir. It's you. She slapped the cuffs on my hands threw me in the back of the car and began to treat me as if I 
was a common criminal. Cuffs were tight. I was sweating profusely as you see me now, but it was even more profusely because there was no AC in the back of the cop car. And as, as I'm getting ready to leave, the elder whose house I went to go visit, the, older, the elderly elder, she comes running down the stairs and begins to scream at this police officer, making it even worse on me because now, you know, she's saying, okay, she's being belligerent with the police officer. And so in my mind, I'm like, oh boy, this is going to get worse. So I get in there, I have the money to bond out, but the whole time that I'm in there, I'm asking God, why am I in this situation? Is it on me, Lord? Did I forget to do something? Was there something going on that I messed up? Why am I in this predicament? And as I'm sitting in the general population area, there's two gentlemen that sit next to me, and one is crying because he went through a situation with his wife. Another one is crying because he's been accused of something that he knows he did not do. And both of these young men were looking for a word from God. To this day, I still keep in contact with these two young men. And they are growing stronger and stronger in the faith. Sometimes God puts you in a storm to be a light for someone else. Jesus said it best that we are to go and make disciples. What are we doing today? Are we sitting down and being entertained in the pews? Or are we going out and spreading the gospel to those who are in need? We have to take the gospel serious. If God puts something on your heart, it's on all of us to share it to others. We can't just keep it to ourselves. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians. Ephesians. Mercy. Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 26. Ephesians 4 and verses 26 and 27. Word of God states. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. A lot of times, our emotions will cause us to be angry. But we have to watch what we say and how we say things to others. We are a reflective of Jesus Christ. A lot of us focus on being Seventh-day Adventists. We love to focus on being Seventh-day Adventists. But who can tell me what it is to be a Seventh-day Adventist? We're looking for the second coming of Christ, but are we Christian? Do we treat people as Christian? Do we talk to people as Christian? Jesus dealt with men that asked questions every day. Which one of us is the greatest? Did he get mad? Or did he show love? Was he impatient? Or was he patient? We know the story of Gethsemane. How many times did Jesus have to tell the disciples to pray for him? Did he say it in anger? Or did he say it in love? When Judas betrayed him for those pieces of silver... Was he upset or did he look in love? When Peter denied Jesus three times, we have to understand, Jesus always did things in love. And people can see how we treat each other. And I'm not just saying outside, but I'm saying in these pews. It's not on a position that you hold in this church. It's not on being the greatest singer in the church. It's not on being the first elder or the head deaconess. It's on following Jesus Christ. It's not on who has the best suit. It's not on who exegetes the best sermon. It's on how we treat each other. 
We are all God's children. Remember it like it was yesterday. My mom was speaking to me and my brother, and she told us, she said, listen, you guys are not to leave the house. You will not go anywhere. I'm, I'm going to the store, and Lenny, you are responsible for your brother. So make sure that you and Aaron are on your best behavior. And so, you know, Lenny was always the good child. He was a good child. I'm just being honest with you. Lenny was the good child. Me, on the other hand, I, I had another thing coming. I had my mind set. I'm going to do what Aaron wants to do, unfortunately, you know. And it's not right, but I'm just telling you this is what it was. So my mom, you know, she was gone, and Lenny was supposed to watch me. And some way or another, I got out of the house. Lenny couldn't find me. I got out of the house. And I'm here to tell you I was outside playing and playing with a few of my friends. And these friends of mine, they were wandering up to go to the pool and hang out at the pool. And one of my friends, he was very, uh, very wild. He put a firecracker in my book bag. I didn't know it was in there. But he put it, not like one of them ones that explode, but just one of the ones that like pop or whatever. And he puts it in my bag. And as the bag's popping, I'm like, what's going on? I'm getting a little crazy. And I run into the road, and I get hit by a car. Car hits me, knocks me down, and everybody is stunned because they're wondering if I'm okay. As I get up, there's no broken bone. As I get up, there's no fracture, there's no pain. I'm here to tell you today that the way the car hit me, it felt like I had something broken. But when I got up, Jesus protected me. We have to understand something, that God sees the dangers in our lives. He sees things before they're going to happen, and he will protect us. But the key is... Are we under that covering? There's a text in Psalms 91 that says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty. The key today is, is our focus fully on God? Story told of a group of cameramen that wanted to get the actual landscape of skydivers jumping out of a plane. So this was taking place in the, in the early 80s. And as these guys were jumping out of the plane, each one would go in and of course they would check their, their, their parachutes and their bags to make sure everything is strapped in and they're good to go. And so the first one goes, he pats him on his back, he jumps out, and he's getting ready to do it. The second guy goes in, and he gets his satchel together, he gets his parachute, he jumps out, they pat him on his back, and he goes and he does it. And this goes on because it was about five or six people. And the last one was the man who was holding the camera. And so the man who was holding the camera, he jumps out. And as he jumps out, he's reaching, and there's no parachute. And they say that in the story, the man with the camera, of course, he, he passed and died. But what we have to understand is that he wasn't fastening to his parachute. He wasn't paying attention to what he needed to pay attention the most. One thing we knew about Jesus, every morning, he got up early. He didn't get up early to reason with Peter. He didn't get up early to reason with John. He didn't get up early to discuss with doubting Thomas. He got up early to spend time with his father. Who are we getting up early and speaking to? Is it your wife? Because she can't save you. 
Is it your husband? He will die one day. Is it the news? Are you wondering what Joe Biden is going to do for us? This man cannot save us. But Jesus can save us. Michael Jordan can't save you. LeBron James can't save you. Dwayne Wade can't save you. But Jesus can save you. We have to keep our focus fully on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In 1820, Augustine Furlan invented a new kind of lens that installed in a lighthouse. Suddenly, one lamp can light the way for all sailors many miles out to sea. Since antiquity, light beacons have been guiding ships to the port. When we look at a lighthouse, a lighthouse helps sailors to see. Where would the ships be today without that lighthouse? Where would they be? How would they be able to see if they did not have the lighthouse? How would they be able to get in the shore? How would they ever be to know that they are safe if they did not have that lighthouse? Question I pose to you today, where would you be? If it wasn't for Jesus. Where would you be if Jesus wasn't in your life today? We think about all that we have gone through. You're looking at a man that was told, his mother was told in the third trimester that your son will not make it. That's what they told my mother. They said that my lungs were underdeveloped. And I would not survive the third trimester. And God told my mother, if you abort this child, you will lose your soul. God has something predestined for everyone in this room. But the question I ask you today, today, if you hear my voice, harden, not your heart. God is calling us here for a reason, not to just hear a word that I'm preaching today, but to spread the gospel. The gospel needs to be spread. Jesus is soon to come. And on each and every corner of Miami, there's someone who's crying who needs money, who's in pain, who's been abused, who's been hurt. And the only hope they will ever know is Jesus. The only joy they will ever know is Jesus. We know who Jesus is to you, but who is Jesus to them if we don't show them? We have to show them the way. We can't get so emotional that this message is about us and are not spreading it to others. God did not say to keep the message. He didn't say to keep it. He said to go and make disciples. He said to spread the gospel to everyone. And as a church, as Adventists, as Christians, followers of Christ, we need to be spreading Amen. the gospel Amen. to everyone. Amen. In 2020, there was an epidemic known as COVID. And that year was a very, very tough, tough year for me because that year I buried my best friend. Now, the thing about this situation, what was so tough to me was that if you know this, they didn't allow a lot of people in the hospital at the time. And there was some pastors who wouldn't go in as well because there was a fear of COVID. So I, I receive a phone call from his mother, uh, her name is Nancy, and she calls me and she says, uh, Aaron, you know how much you love Lorenzo. Could you go and uh, be there for him in his last moments? Because, unfortunately, he had kidney disease. He was on dialysis. And so if you know anything about kidney disease and dialysis, you're not going to be able to make it because your kidneys are not strong enough because of the disease of COVID. And so as I'm in the hospital, 
I'm there and I'm just a loss for words because I remember that this young man, me and him played basketball together. Uh, we, we basically did almost everything together. I remember our first time we ever met, we exchanged sandwiches because my mom was heavy on being vegetarian. So my, my, my sandwiches was a striple sandwich and he had a turkey sandwich. And I said, I'm gonna trade half of my turkey sandwich for your triple sandwich because this is gonna be the best thing ever. We gonna have mismatching sandwiches. And so, you know, we had so many memories together and at this point, you know, he is in a coma. He's in a coma and there's nothing he can do. He can't speak, he can't talk. And so my, my only concern was as in there, has Lorenzo made his calling an election sure? So I'm in the hospital with him and I'm in the room and I'm praying and I begin to sing and I don't have the best singing voice, but I begin to sing our favorite song from Commission, The Ordinary Just Won't Do. Then I begin to sing Heart of Mine and all the many Commission songs that we grew up listening to just to see if I can make an impression on this man as he's in this coma. And I, I, I begin to cry and I say, man, heaven won't be the same if you're not there. I can't hear you. I, I can't feel you, but Lorenzo, please just give me a sign. I, I, I want to know that you want to be there and that you've made your call election sure. I know I've made mistakes. I know you've made mistakes, but Lorenzo, please, please give me a sign. And as I begin to cry, Lorenzo can't talk. Lorenzo can't move. He can't even blink his eye. But I begin to see tears flowing down Lorenzo's face. Letting me know that Lorenzo was making his commitment. Today, God is calling each and every one of us. I don't know what you did this week. I don't know what you did last night. But Jesus loves you. He says, while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died. We all are going through something, but Jesus paid it all. All to him, I owe. We need to give our all to Christ. God is calling for us today to stand. Men that will stand even if the heavens will fall. You know God is calling you. You know you've been through a lot. And Jesus is calling for us to give him our all. Not just in our money, but in our time. Not just in our time, but how we treat others. If you feel what I'm saying today, that God is calling, then you will stand with me today. You will stand and give God your all. God is calling for us. To give him our all. Jesus is calling. We need to make our calling an election sure. If you feel Jesus is calling, then stand with me today. Let us pray. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is your name. You are a God that despite our infirmities, despite our weaknesses, despite how feeble we are, you love us. You look past our sins. For it says it in Micah 7, 19, who is a God like this that will forgive? You show delight in forgiving us when we make mistakes. Father, we just ask today that you be with each individual here at the Tabernacle Church. Bless the ministries here at this church. Help us to realize that there's no greater work than evangelizing. Help us to realize that there's so many people out here who are in need, who are crying, who are dying, who are weeping, who are dealing with so much, and we have to spread this gospel. Help us to make our calling an election sure. Help us to realize it's how we treat people. It's how we love people. God, 
is calling for us to be faithful stewards of our time, of our mind, and of our effort. Now, Father, bless us today on this Sabbath day. Bless each individual here. Help us to be ready that when you are soon to come in the clouds of glory, that we will all make our calling and election sure, holding hands ready to go with you to your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank um, Chaplain Newton for that powerful word today. If the Holy Spirit has touched your heart and moved you in a way to be drawn closer to Jesus, to invest deeper in your spiritual walk with him, I want you to know that we have available to you Bible studies that you can learn a little bit more. If you want to be baptized, just let myself nor any of the other elders of the church this morning, our sister Pat Simmons. Pat Simmons, can you stand please for us? Just let this lady know if you want to get, want to get baptized and we definitely will be able to work with you and help that you can make your call and an election sure. Um, if you need someone to pray for you, uh, just let me know. I'm the head of the prayer ministry's department, but we have lots of other people who will be able to pray for, with you and for you. And we, we hope that you can make uh, that deep commitment to Jesus Christ today. We, we look forward to seeing you again next week, and we hope that by uh, God's grace, you will be among the number when the saints go marching in. I want, I want to remind uh, you, for those of you who are seniors who are planning to uh, go away on the walk, uh, I want you to meet up front here with Sheree um, uh, on the organ side after church. And those of you who are interested in Pathfinders, there's a Pathfinder meeting on the piano side over here. For those of you who want to go to Campery or plan to go to Campery, they have some uh, other information for you on Campery. So uh, I would hope that you would be available for that. At this time, we're going to go into, we want, I want you to remain because we have some information to share with you. I'm going to call our clerk forward. Just wait a second. Uh, we, we'll be dismissed shortly. But uh, I want our clerk to talk. Thank you for worshiping with us here today at Tabernacle. We pray that you're blessed by today's service. Don't forget, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel by clicking the button below and the notification bell. If you're watching on Facebook, please like our page, share, and follow us. God bless you.